So we were discussing D time spontaneous supersymmetry breaking. And last time we had realized that uh, the potential we considered a u1 theory with uh, two chiral multiples phi plus and phi minus and the corresponding uh, potential function was one half eta square plus g square by 2 q plus phi plus star phi plus q minus phi minus phi minus star by q plus and q minus were the charges of the two super uh, chiral super multiplets square plus eta q plus phi plus star phi plus q minus phi minus star phi minus and then m square phi plus star phi plus phi minus star phi minus and we minimize this in order to find out what is the ground state by demanding that derivative of this potential should be 0 for ground state and the derivative we wrote of v with respect to phi plus minus star was m square plus q plus minus g eta plus g square q plus minus q plus phi plus star phi plus plus q minus phi minus star phi minus whole thing multiplied by phi plus minus equal to 0. So, we wanted to find out minimum of this potential and we considered one case in which uh, m square was smaller than q minus g eta. The other case was what we were dis discussing case 2 that was m square is less than mod q minus g eta. Recall we have taken q plus to be positive and q minus be negative. So, for this mod q minus m square smaller than this that would mean that m square for the lower sign here this term is negative. Now, if this term is ok and negative then corresponding to phi minus the ground state could be when this object is 0. For the upper sign these are all positive terms. So, the ground state is so minimum is for phi plus equal to 0 because this is all positive. So, this must be 0. For the lower sign because m square is smaller than this this can this is negative so this can be 0. So, m square plus q minus g eta plus g square now we are talking about the lower sign. So, g minus 5 ground state we have uh, is 0. So, that does not contribute. So, this one we have to solve this to get the ground state. So, that means phi star phi minus is equal to 1 by g square q minus square and q is negative. So, I write it mod q minus g eta minus m square. So, this is the ground state value. 
this is the value for which we have the minimum of the potential and let us give this a name we call this object is theta square. So, let me write down here vacuum is 5 plus vacuum value equal to 0, 5 minus vacuum value equal to theta, where theta capital square is 1 by g square q minus square mod q minus g eta minus m square. So, that is our vacuum. <coughs> now, recall the, the constraint equations for auxiliary fields. D was minus eta minus g q plus phi plus star phi plus q minus phi minus star phi minus. That was the constraint equation for auxiliary field D. And for auxiliary field F plus minus goes minus m phi minus plus plus was minus star. So, now since we know the ground state values of scalar fields, we can find out what are the ground state values of auxiliary fields. So, ground state value of d is minus eta, ground state of phi is 0, this object is minus g q minus theta square. or I could write this as minus eta plus g q minus mod theta square because q minus is negative. So, I can write it mod and change the sign and I can put these values in it. So, that gives me minus eta plus g q mod times g square q minus square g mod g eta minus m square. Now, this term cancels this. So, I am only left with this object and that is minus m square g mod is that what it is? So, we find in this ground state d auxiliary field has a non zero vacuum expectation value. What about f? f minus is m times f plus uh, f, uh, phi plus phi plus vacuum expectation value is 0. So, this is 0 what about f plus f plus phi x phi minus uh, phi minus expectation value is theta. So, it is minus m theta. So, what do we have? We have a theory where the d auxiliary field is a non zero vacuum expectation value and one of the f's has a non zero ex vacuum expectation value. So, this is also non zero. Now, D and F plus I have the non zero vacuum expectation value that means there is a linear combination of these two auxiliary fields which does not have vacuum expectation value and one linear combination which does have. Now, what is the linear combination that 
So, one linear combination of f plus and if you see recall how d appears as the auxiliary uh, the d component of the v vector field it was d by 2. So, the field really is d by d square by 2. So, the is this a linear combination of f plus and d by square root 2 still has no vacuum expectation value and orthogonal combination has. So, let me write down what this this combination. So, vacuum expectation value of m plus phi minus square root 2 mod q g theta d by square root 2. This object, this linear combination, if you put in the vacuum expectation value of f plus and d by root 2 from there, you will discover this is 0. So, this is a linear combination and if I normalize this linear combination by m, where m square is m square plus 2 q minus square g square theta square the coefficients of these squares of the coefficients of f plus. So, that would be a normalization that, that would make them now one linear combination. Orthogonal combination is 1 by m m d by root 2 plus 2 q minus mod g theta f plus. This is orthogonal to that. f and d by 2 interchange and you change the sign that is an orthogonal combination. Now, this object does not does have non zero vacuum expectation value. So, this linear combination of the auxiliary fields which has non zero vacuum expectation value what is the corresponding fermion partner of these? Fermion partner of lambda uh, d is the lambda, fermion partner of f, f plus was what we call psi plus. So, therefore, a combination com the fermion the fermionic partner of this combination which is 1 by m m lambda by square root 2 plus root 2 q minus mod g theta psi plus. Did I write it right? this would be the massless Goldsteino. which is the super partner fermionic super partner of this combination which picks up non zero vacuum expectation value.
Now, let us look at the other part of the mass spectrum of this theory. What is the mass spectrum? And we will discover that Suzy is broken because auxiliary fields pick up non-zero vacuum expectation value, but we will discover that even gauge symmetry is broken. Gauge symmetry is the U1 gauge symmetry. is spontaneously broken. That is photon, the so called photon or the gauge field is massive in this theory. Now, let's me, let me let us do the details study the spectrum in detail spectrum. So, what do I do? Phi minus picks up a vacuum expectation value. So, expand the phi x about its vacuum expectation value. I think I have given a name phi dash. So, phi minus write it as vacuum expectation value plus an extra p and rename phi plus and phi a complex scalar just so that we do not have to carry this plus okay, all along and put it back into this potential and collect the bilinear terms that will give you the masses of the various scalar fields. So, then potential would become <coughs> m square m capital M square divided by 2 I think is it 2, 2 q minus square g square this is phi independent term phi independent term is the vacuum value and vacuum value is simply the value of did I rub off uh, the vacuum values of f and d yes the square of these two and if you see that if you edit up that is what it is this object is half vacuum expectation d of f minus has no vacuum expectation value you just do from those expressions you edit up take this and that is what the vacuum value is plus if you calculate it is m square 1 minus q plus by q minus phi star phi for this field. Just put this in, in this potential collect the phi square phi 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 na star phi term this is how it will turn out. Then make a linear combination of phi dash plus phi dash star normalized by square root 2 that is a real field and you will get a term square of that with a coefficient q minus square g square capital theta square. So, phi minus dash is this the component of phi minus away from the vacuum value is phi dash. Take the real part of that and you will get this. and then you will get interaction terms. So, you will get only these two bilinear terms others are higher order terms trilinear. So, they are interaction terms.
Now notice that it's only one linear combination of phi prime, the real part of phi prime that's emerging here. Imaginary part of phi prime is not there. So there is no mass term for imaginary part of phi. This is a complex field phi plus, we call renamed it phi. So this gives you a one scalar complex scalar with this mass. This gives you a real scalar with this mass. But there is no mass for the imaginary part of phi. That is not surprising because we said gauge symmetry is broken, so there has to be a gold stone. That is the one that will become the longitudinal part of the massive gauge field. <coughs> so, now let me list it. So, what we have a complex scalar. phi with mass square given by m square 1 minus q plus by q minus. Then we have one real scalar phi prime plus phi prime star square root 2 with mass what have I called it m prime or something m prime square. Now, this is to be written as half times m prime square because the scalar field mass is half times m square. Complex field is mass is only m square in fact of two difference. So, you put that half in that means mass is twice this. <coughs> then what we said no mass for the imaginary part of phi minus that means phi minus minus phi star by root 2 times i. So, this this is the goldstone boson which becomes the longitudinal part of massive gauge field. That is the standard Higgs mechanism. Now, let us see what is the mass of the gauge field. So how do you figure out mass of the gauge fields? You look at the Lagrangian. In Lagrangian, you what did you have? You have you had a term phi minus mod square. You also had a phi plus mod square, but phi plus has no vacuum expectation value that so that is not going to give us any mass for gauge fields. So, this object this has a term g square q minus square phi minus times a mu a mu. Besides other terms, this square has this term. So, if you put a vacuum expectation value for this object, that gives you the mass for four, uh, gauge field. So, the mass for gauge field is, a, is 
So, if I put vacuum expectation value for this, this is g square q minus square theta square a mu a mu that is the mass term. And the mass is twice g square q minus square theta square. The same reason y factor 2 here like we put it for the real scalar. This thing is half m a square. So, this is now the bosonic spectrum of the theory. A complex scalar of mass this much, a real scalar of mass this much and a gauge field of mass this much. Now, what about fermions? So, fermion masses. What are the fermion masses mass terms in our theory? We have two fermion mass terms in theory. One was that came from minus half super potential second derivative with respect to phi plus and phi minus psi plus and psi minus and permission conjugate. That was the f term of the super potential. There was a piece like this. Half, well half goes away because uh, after differentiation. So, second derivative of phi plus phi minus of the super potential. And then we also had the piece from the coupling term of the vector field with the chiral super fields. We had a mass term Yukawa coupling term from there, which was root g. Let me write it down. Have I written it here somewhere? Root g phi minus root g g q plus phi plus star psi plus lambda plus phi plus psi bar lambda bar plus root g q minus phi minus star psi minus lambda plus phi minus star psi minus lambda bar. And this second derivative was simply m. So, these are the terms in the Lagrangian density if you go which have bilinears in fermions. So, let us put the vacuum expectation values into this and see what this bilinear looks like because that will give us the masses for fermions. Now, this does not contribute because, because what vacuum expectation value of phi is phi plus is 0. So, only the contribution will come here. So, the mass terms fermion mass terms are minus m psi plus psi minus plus Hermitian, Hermitian conjugate is psi plus bar psi minus bar plus root 2 g q minus theta psi minus lambda psi minus bar lambda bar phi minus well one of them should be without star yes. So, expectation value of this which is theta expectation value of this which is theta capital theta. Now, the this is not in a diagonalized form. So, let us diagonalize it in order to get the mass, mass eigenvalues. Now, let me rewrite this. 
in the following way minus m oh no psi uh, take psi minus out m psi plus is from here minus root 2 g q minus and uh, so make it mod if I make it mod this changes sign because q is negative so I should have had a plus sign then what did I or was there a minus here there is a minus here right so there is a minus here there is a minus here so there is a minus here so that will make it mod q times theta lambda minus psi minus bar m psi plus bar minus root 2 g q minus theta lambda bar just rewrite this take psi minus bar common from this expression and this expression uh, psi minus common and from this one psi minus bar from this one and this one So that is it picks up a combination linear combination of psi plus and lambda. So uh, now this is a uh, I think I rubbed off uh, I also made a linear combination of fermions earlier which was Goldstone Goldstino just if you look at the no, uh, notes you will see that that it is the or it is not the Goldstino combination but it is the orthogonal combination. So, if I normalize it, so I can write this as minus m psi minus call it chi, where chi is 1 by m m psi plus minus root 2 g minus uh, q, um, q mod theta lambda. plus psi minus bar chi bar. So, this gives me a mass term for my Dirac fermion whose left handed component is psi minus a right handed component is chi bar the linear combination the two. So, it is a Dirac fermion whose left handed component is psi minus and right handed component is chi bar and has mass m and m is square root of somewhere we wrote it m m is m square plus 2 g square q minus square theta square m square is this coefficient square plus this coefficient square And the orthogonal combination of 
orthogonal combination call it chi tilde which is 1 by m of m lambda minus plus root 2 g mod q theta psi plus is the Goldstein massless. So that is not uh, that is what we had said earlier because this is the combination which was the fermionic super partner of the auxiliary field linear combination of auxiliary fields that picked up non-zero vacuum expectation value. So the fermionic partner has to be the massless goals no, that is what we discovered by explicit calculation. Now we have the complete spectrum both bosonic and fermionic. Let us see what the mass square matrix of the trace of the mass square matrix of bosons and fermions look like now. So, trace of the bosonic mass matrix is sum of the bosonic masses because they are all diagonal we have found in eigenstates. So, it is simply the sum of the m squares of boson. So, this is m phi square plus m phi prime square plus m a square. Except that we said that this this did, did, uh, defined weighted by the number of independent degrees of freedom in H. Complex field, this phi was complex scalar field. So, it has 2 degrees of freedom. This was a real scalar field, it has only 1 degree of freedom. This is a massive gauge field, it has 3 degrees of freedom. Now, how much is so m phi square from there is m square 1 minus q plus by q minus m phi square is 2 g square mod q square theta square and m a square is 3 times that is 6 g square q minus square theta square. So, that is 2 m square 1 minus q plus q minus 8 g square q minus square. Similarly, what is the trace of the fermion mass matrix? We have only one fermion, massive fermion, which is which is a Dirac fermion, with the mass given by there. So m square is, so it is m square of the Dirac fermion, and that object is m square plus two. Is that what it is? I can't read from here. Theta square. m square 2 theta. Yeah. This is what it is. But a Dirac fermion has 4 independent degrees of freedom. For each one of them we count it as 1. So, it is 4 times this. So, it is 4 times this. Now, 
Now, what does trace m b square trace minus trace m f square look like? This goes away 2 m square Yes, so there, there is 4 m square here, there is 2 m square here. So, 4 that makes it minus 2 m square 1 plus q plus q minus. Is that correct? Something is not right. Yeah, that is okay. So, this I write as minus 2 m square q minus q plus q minus. This I write as 2 m square mod q q plus q minus because q is negative minus is negative. So, mod q and absorb that sign. Now, we rubbed off somewhere. Recall what was the vacuum expectation value of D field? Just check from your notes. It was minus m square g times mod q. So, therefore, I can rewrite this as minus 2 g vacuum expectation q plus q q minus vacuum expectation value of d. So, super trace of m m square which is sum of minus 2 j to 2 j plus 1 times m j square is minus 2 g q plus q minus this is the formula we had found when we studied the first case also. So, this is a generic property of d type supersymmetry breakings is that the super trace of the mass matrix is always proportional to the sum of the u 1 charges and the vacuum expectation value of the d field. So, if d field has vacuum expectation value 0 then the sum is 0. Now, if you have both f type and d types uh, uh, breaking, which in fact the second case was more of that was that of that kind, it had both d uh, picking up a non zero vacuum expectation value and one of the f's picking vacuum expectation value. What you have on the right hand side is only the vacuum expectation value of d. So, the cancellation of the Bose Fermi masses in a broken supersymmetric theory is exact only when q plus q minus add up to 0. So, we can write it in words so that we register it as a statement.
exact cancellation of the trace of Bose mass matrix square and the Fermi mass matrix square is obtained only if trace q the u1 charges u1 is 0. There is another property of this theory when the trace q 1 is not 0, when q plus and q minus do not add up to 0, this theory has um, uh, another features, uh, other kinds of features. One feature is chiral anomaly, when trace q u 1 is not 0, there is chiral anomaly. Means if you do the quantum theory with uh, this, uh, do the quantization of this theory, what you realize is that chiral symmetry of the fermions is violated. So, there are various reasons we do not like that because any gauge theory which has chiral anomalies in the gauge theory ten is a non normalizable theory. So, we would we do not want them. So, we do not want theories where the u 1 trace is non 0. Gauge the if we have a because we have gauged this uh, symmetry, if you do not gauge it, there, there is no problem, but if you gauge it, that theory is non normalizable. One, there is another reason why we require trace q of u 1 to be 0. That is that I think I said it last time also let me repeat it again is that the first in the first place the reason why we wanted supersymmetry was because supersymmetry quantum field theories with supersymmetry had certain nice properties and the nice property that is is that they do not have correlated divergences. That implies that the low mass scales are relatively stable in such theories. For example, in the standard model, if you want 100 GV scale, which is what the still electroweak theory is, not receive large quantum corrections, then you better have supersymmetry. Otherwise, it will receive large quantum corrections from any physics that is beyond 1 GV. But that property on supersymmetry theory is also true only if trace of u 1 is 0 charges trace of u 1 charge is 0. So, quadratic divergences in quantum supersymmetric theories are also absent only if trace q u 1 is 0. It is true even when supersymmetry is exact. So, that is for varieties of reasons you would want q plus and q minus to be add up to 0. Okay, now, that we have learnt how to break supersymmetry spontaneously, 
Now, is this useful for uh, us to do real physics? Which means, can I do standard uh, supersymmetrized standard model and introduce spontaneous symmetry breaking by any of these mechanisms or a combination of these mechanisms to explain standard model physics? Answer, unfortunately, is no. So we learned this game, but now we're going to say that it's not going to help us. So spontaneous Suzy breaking in supersymmetrized standard model is not phenomenologically acceptable. The reason is because it would require some of the super partners of the particles that we know to be lighter than them and we have not seen them. Also you always end up with a massless particle. Oh, we could pay, give that mass by maybe some, um, something else, but this is a major reason. Goldstino is always massless. Yeah, but it is a fermion, Goldstino fermion, so we can. No, but you should have seen it. Uh, yeah, that is another, but seen it, but then maybe its couplings are very weak and we can, we can make its couplings be very weak. That, you may say it is dark matter, maybe it is dark matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, you have a point, you have a point. There are, there are light particles, there are massless particles. Uh, I do not know how weak you can make it because it is partner of the yeah, ele electro the coupling still would be electro weak, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, yeah, you are right. So, there are many so phenomenological problems. So, it is not a very nice thing to do. So, we have to do supersymmetry breaking some other way. Now, how do you do? But we have to do supersymmetry breaking in a way we do not we don't introduce quadratic divergences. Spontaneous symmetry breaking was one method of doing it in a way when quadratic divergences were not introduced. So, break supersymmetry without introducing quadratic divergences in the quantum theory this is done by adding explicit Susie breaking terms in the Lagrangian density a class of uh, supersymmetry breaking a class of Susie breaking terms and this class has the property that that no quadratic divergences are introduced. And there is a name given to this class, they call soft breakings. Soft breaking is the terms which do not change the divergence structure of a theory. So, if we do not have a quadratic divergence in a theory, it will not introduce it, these terms will not introduce. But there are explicit breaking terms. In fact, all the spontaneous symmetry breaking that we did earlier, uh, we showed it earlier, it introduced uh, mass splittings. So, it introduced uh, certain uh, symmetry breaking terms because the masses are not equal, right. Huh? in the theory. All those terms were soft. 
but those are not the only soft terms that you can have the terms that you have in spontaneous symmetry breaking soft the term, symmetry breaking terms are soft but those are not the only soft terms that you can have so there are other terms and you can people have listed them what are those you can work them out what they are from certain general properties i'll also give you the list of now soft symmetry breaking terms soft susy breaking so if you have a supersymmetric theory with a given spore potential which is a polynomial function of the chiral superfields so if you take phi i to be the first component of the chiral superfield this the uh, the scalar component of the chiral superfield then super potential would be written in some way we had written it earlier sum h i times phi i let me say or let me call it superfield phi i plus mu i j phi i j plus g i j k phi i phi j phi k that's the super potential so if you put normalize your super potential that it is a single phi with some coefficients h i do phi is with coefficients mu i j and three phi and there cannot be more than three phi for the reason that we want a normalizable theory normally why i wrote this is that normally supersymmetry breaking soft terms are given in terms of coefficients which are normalized by these coefficients so that's why i wrote them what these are that's just a convenient normalization so soft terms now take the scalar component of these chiral superfields the complex co the lowest component theta less component that's phi i multiply by same h i and c i and sum over i add this to your lagrangian this is a soft term this does not introduce any coordinate divergences and these coefficients are measured generally in reference to this one and that's why it's written like this next take the product of these mu i j and normalize uh, and call that coefficient what i will call b i j sum over i and j these are also soft breaking then take three of them that's also a soft term huh? yes it goes to coupling but you measure now these extra couplings in uh, as a ratio with respect to the old couplings see these are new couplings we are introducing these a's no these are this is the, the property of the yes see this goes into the coupling it changes only the scalar part of it but doesn't change the fermion Uh, the uh, other part of it of the super potential right hmm? so um, yes the nice property of these objects is that it does not change the coordinate divergences it does not introduce coordinate divergences
not only that you could also take a phi i star phi j and multiply it by some parameter m i j square and sum over i j. This is also a soft term. This is simple, a mass term for the scalar fields. Yes, no, no, this is not a uh, 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 superpotential. This is the term in Lagrangian density. It does not matter. It breaks in holomorphicity, it breaks in whatever. It, but it, it would be a mass term, right, for scalar fields. Adding an extra piece in scalars does not change the, uh, uh, the divergence structure. So, that is also a soft term. No, these are not these, these these kinds of terms will not arise. I mean, some of them will arise from the superpotential, but they won't. They don't have super partners. From superpotential, also when you do the masses, there'll be a mass term of this kind. But these scalar fields will have this extra mass, but accompanying fermions don't have that extra mass. So that breaks supersymmetry. So this is explicit breaking of supersymmetry. But it is soft breaking. Then, if you have gauge zeros in your field, so you have a certain gauge group and you have the corresponding gauge zeros lambda a, a corresponds to the index in the gauge group. introduce a term like this that is also soft and since this is not self conjugate, so Hermitian conjugate. <coughs> that is it, yes anything that is that is because we do not know what, what else to do because, but we want to keep the property that it should not introduce quadratic divergences. So, write down the most general thing that you can write. So, these are the now these are the all possibilities that you can have. Uh, why not? Ah, good one. I mean, yeah, no, you mean why not? Yeah, you see, he has already said what I was going to say next. I have put a Gagino fermion term. Notice there is no No chiral fermion mass term here. Chiral fermion mass terms are not soft, they introduce quadratic divergences, mm -hmm. except in very special cases. These introduce quadratic divergences except in special circumstances. Particularly even theory. But what are those special circumstances? If there are no gauge singlet super fields so you could have gauge neutral super fields in your theory 
if you do not have them, then you can introduce them, then these are soft. If you have no gauge singlet superfields in the theory, then then uh, psi a m a b uh, then 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 chiral chiral super field, uh, chiral uh, fermion mass terms are soft so in fact let me say it in more detail For models without any singlet superfields, gauge singlet fields, there are in fact two, two types of uh, terms that you can add. One is that for chiral superfields. phi a in the adjoint representation of the gauge group, terms of the kind psi a m hat a b psi b plus Hermitian conjugate and also psi a m tilde a b lambda b plus Hermitian conjugate are soft. So, if you have a chiral super field in the joint representation, then you can consider mass terms of this kind psi a some mass matrix three, three parameters m hat a b psi b and Hermitian conjugate. You can add that, that is also a soft term or psi a and lambda, lambda is uh, the uh, gauge uh, gauge you know for me on. You can have mixed mass terms also which are soft. And then there is one more soft term that you can add in this situation. So, this is A, this is B, phi i star phi j phi k trilinear coupling is also soft only if there are no singlet field super fields in the theory. That is a little technical exercise uh, you, you, uh, you have to do, uh, the, uh, which I am not going to do here. First, any operator of mass dimension more than 4 is not soft, but now every ma operator of mass dimension f uh, less than 4 is also not soft. There are exceptions. Exceptions are precisely these situations when there is a so if this is then this is a mass dimension less than four, it becomes. But if if there is a singlet uh, gauge singlet chiral superfield, then it introduces quadratic divergence because coupling of that with these fields then introduce quadratic divergences. It has to do essentially with the nature of the D term d term picks up uh, quadratic divergences in such theories. So, now, now we are in a big mess. Now, if I do standard model and supersymmetry transit and I have for every super field, uh, so every uh, particle I have a super field for every for electron I have a chiral superfield, for muon I have a chiral superfield, for 
uh, quarks I have, leptons, uh, four leptons, each one of them I have chiral support fields for gauge, gauge fields I have. So I have a huge spectrum. And if I want to write down the possible most general supersymmetry breaking terms from them, I would construct from these kinds of things. And if you do that, you realize the number of parameters that you introduce to the th in the theory. So, uh, supersymmetrized standard model with soft SUSY breaking has more than 100 new parameters. Yeah, because we do not know how to break supersymmetry. Essentially, we do not know how to break supersymmetry. So, we have we are left with only one option is that we think of the most general situation. And if we think of most general situation, then we have under more than 100 parameters to play with. Now, more than 100 parameters to play with does not allow you any robust predictions. So, if anybody tells you supersymmetry is ruled out or not ruled out, he is talking about in the context of a very specific assumptions made on these 100 parameters. You reduce them to smaller numbers, which is manageable, then play around and build mo do model building. You change those numbers, your mass spectrum changes, your couplings change, your whole prediction changes. So, reliability of any of those statements, I mean you cannot make a robust prediction with 100 para new parameters. Okay. So, hopefully, experiment will be the guide. That is why experiment is very important. No, is it, there is there is so much of parameter freedom right now, we do not really know how to make concrete predictions. So, in some simplified pictures, uh, uh, Shirihari will tell you more about it. Uh, supersymmetry breaking and uh, supersymmetrizing standard model. And, and uh, next lecture, Shri Hari is going to take. This is my last lecture, so thank you very much. I hope mm. you enjoyed what we did here. And uh, if you have any more questions, any of these things, you can always contact me. So we'll stop at that today. So this is where it starts. The real model building starts now.